Welcome, everyone. Um, wow, I should encourage like some of the people who are all right here to just go a little <laughs> bit over, or it's all going to be focused on half the room. But um, welcome, and for everyone online, welcome as well. So we're webcasting this, and it'll be available um, on demand as well, so whenever you're listening to us. And I'm Sean Flynn. I'm from the program on information, justice, and intellectual property. I'm here to Welcome, Margaret O'Mara, um, professor from the University of Washington, professor of history, and is going to be talking today about her history of Silicon Valley and really the larger technology industry. And I start with this slide of some work from uh, Kathy Kleiman, actually, who's a, who's a professor here in our intellectual property clinic, because I think it illustrates one of the interesting connections between Margaret's work and our IP clinic and the school in general. And so one of the stories that I found really interesting in, in Margaret's book as I was reading it over the weekend um, is the history of coders, the history of computer programmers in the post-World War II period who were all women. And so it was women who were doing the original computer programming in part because it was perceived as a clerical task instead of a creative task. And so they were known as coders to emphasize that clerical component. And there's a, a running kind of theme throughout her book of the, of the gender dimension of the evolution of the technology um, industry, which parallels in many ways the birth of this, of this school in particular. So she tells the story of, for instance, of, of Anne Hardy, um, a, a, a person who really should be a, a computer engineer, but was steered into a, a pre-med background because that was seen as more appropriate for women at the time. And this school, of course, was founded by women for women at a time when women were also excluded from the profession of law. All the, all the major Harvards and Stanfords of the world did not um, accept women as lawyers, and so this school was created by women to create a top flight educational program for women who, like scientists at the time, were being steered away from this profession. So I thought it was a, a really interesting connection here, and it was a connection to, to Kathy's work that I immediately called her last night when I got to that <laughs> point of the book. Like, this, you got to come. This is going to be a really, a really interesting talk. So I was really, I was really interested um, to hear that aspect. But and some other aspects of the book that I thought um, were particularly helpful, um, especially to students. The, so Margaret and I met um, in the Clinton administration in the 1990s. And she's clearly a, a political junkie. So part of this story, in addition to be a story of the technology industry, is really a story of the politics at the time and particularly the politics of the 1990s, which, which I have to admit I felt a little shocking to see that as history. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but I reflected back and kind of thinking through, well, how many of my students actually know who Ross Perot is <laughs> or who Paul Songus is or really like who Clinton really was about? Like what, what did Bill Clinton kind of stand for? I mean, I'm sure... All of you know Bill Clinton, but I really, I, I wonder that political evolution, which is part of what's told in the book. I mean, the, the story of how Clinton Gore, a big piece of how they constructed their platform was to appeal to the tech sector mm -hmm. who, were, who were full of Reaganites, mm -hmm. uh, who didn't see themselves necessarily as Democrats and certainly didn't see themselves as, as um, Elizabeth Warren Democrats. Right, so it was it was a, a different kind of brand of politics was constructed, in part to appeal to this particular sector. So I, I found that part of the story, although shocking in some respects, um, one that that students should really be reading. I mean, it's it's a great way to get a little bit of the flavor of the evolution of presidential and national politics um, through a field, you know, the the field of technological history that you may find. Extremely interesting. So it's um, so it's a it's a it's a story of Silicon Valley. It's a story of of the birth of a technology industry. It's it's a story of other places as well, right? I mean, um, 
of Boston, of, of a little bit of LA, of certainly a lot of Seattle, of these different places in which a complex interaction between institutions like government, defense, the defense industry in particular, but also universities, universities that explicitly constructed themselves um, around a desire to be players within this field. So Stanford plays a big role, but uh, as does MIT and, and um, other places that are frankly in the news right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a story about gender, as I talked about. It's a story about affirmative action. It's a story about, I, there is an interesting point in the book of it's in a story about affirmative action rules that apply to all federal contractors. And this entire industry was essentially filled with federal contractors and apparently ignored the affirmative action rules. So, that, so there's an interesting um, story that isn't told in the book about why that. You know, where's what's the gap in mm -hmm. um, in our in our enforcement system, and, and that's actually what I was working on when we yeah. knew each other was um, the Clinton administration's review of affirmative action policy. So that part of the story really kind of stuck out to me as something with a with a, a, a personal connection to my own history. It's there's a little bit of intellectual property in the story. Um, there's California's refusal to enforce non compete. Um, agreements kind of pave the way for technology transfer through free flow of employees through the different companies, which is an interesting story for our intellectual property folks. And there's also stories of kind of the pre and post Bayh-Dole Act, like before the Bayh-Dole Act, if you can, if you constructed a invention that was patentable um, under a government contract, that invention belonged to the government, and post. By Dole Act in the 19, I think 1984 was the By Dole Act. Um, the inventor under a government contract could keep that invention. So there's and there's and there's reflections on um, how companies were thinking about receiving government inventions, uh, government subsidies for their inventions, funding for their inventions. Um, you know, pre and post By Dole. And the main story, of course, is about the development of um, hotbeds for technology industry incubation, not just in Silicon Valley, but in, in the Boston suburbs and suburban Virginia, Seattle, et cetera, but particularly in, in what's been known as the Silicon Valley. And, and I'll let Margaret tell that story. But I wanted to, to point out one, one other kind of part of the story that I found particularly useful at, um, and even, and I think this is your word in the book, prescient, which is um, the work of, of Alvin Toffler, who, who I, I don't know, actually. And, and I literally this morning um, bought Alvin Toffler's Future Shock um, on Amazon, of course. Of course. <laughs> and so he wrote in 1984 and is, and is summarized in the book, which is the year of the famous Apple Microsoft Super Bowl ad. And about 10 years before my average law student was born. Um, and he wrote about how electronic communications would enable a splintering of mass culture into thousands of different specialized channels where everybody could get their own specially tailored news. And how the inundation by information would reduce attention spans and increase skepticism towards expert authority. And so that, of course, is one of the hot debates today of how technology has kind of shifted from being um, this utopian ideal um, and, the, and the rhetoric of, of kind of freedom and uncharted territories to, I think, in the, in the zeitgeist now, feeling that technology um, may be becoming a threat, right? And, and history shows us that we are not the first to experience that. And so sometimes history can help us see the present a little more clearly. And so for those looking for such insights, I think this book is a great read. I think, it, I think it's a great read um, for its history of the technology industry itself, for which for many students looking to enter it, I think it's key to have that kind of understanding of some, who some of the players are and the interaction with government that made that possible. 
But it's also a great read to give you a reflection of really the political and social history of the period through the lens of that technology industry. And so with that, I just want to thank you, Margaret, for coming, for sharing your ideas with you, with us. And I'm going to give it over to you after I put on your PowerPoints <laughs> instead of our picture. And um, we'll save plenty of room for discussion in the back. So I, I urge you to think about your questions. And uh, Mike Carroll, our, our, um, one of our faculty directors, will moderate that aspect. So with that. Okay. I oh, invite you awesome. to come. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Make sure this is on. There we go. Hi. First of all, thank you so much, Sean, for, for organizing this. Thank you all for coming. I'm just really excited to be here. Um, my, old, my old home, the, what we in Seattle call the Other Washington, uh, and to talk about this book that has been uh, really the book, uh, people ask me why I wrote this book. Um, well, there was one personal reason I wrote this book, which is this is the book I wished existed 20 years ago when I moved out to California at the height of the dot-com boom to work on my dissertation, which was sort of morphing from a project about the domestic economic policies of the Eisenhower administration uh, into uh, something that was very much about the military-industrial complex because, yes, that really was the core of the d economic transformation during those years was the propulsive force of the Cold War. And so I, I, uh, I, I, as I was exploring the history of tech as a graduate student, as someone who'd had experience in politics and policy, but was not a technologist, was not someone who knew the, understood the technology. I was a computer user, not a software maker. Um, I encountered a lot of books about the technology itself. I encountered a lot of books about particular entrepreneurs, and kind of iconic leaders of companies, of particular companies. It was the dot-com era. There were a lot of quickly produced journalistic accounts of what was going on. Uh, and I didn't have anything that pulled it all together that told me where, how it all came to be and the long view of where it started and where it ended. And the world was waiting for this, but then there still hasn't been one in since. So, I, so about five years ago, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to write it myself. Um, and what I wanted to do in this book was to first address a question that has been, I've been asked many times in the last two decades since I did produce my first book, which was about the, the Cold War and tech. Um, which was, how did Silicon Valley do it, and how do you build another one? And so I answer those questions in this book. Um, but, and that was where I started at five years ago in 2014 when I started working on this in earnest. And as I ended writing it, I finished the last pieces of the fi final manuscript in the summer and early fall of 2018. I realized that it was answering another question, which is how did we get to now? How did we get to the big five? How did we get to this world eaten by software? How did we get to a place where everybody who is moving through, in, living in North America, living in, in Europe, living in most of the um, industrial, industrialized or, or, or newly industrial world, even if you decide that you don't want to be on Facebook, that you don't want to buy anything from Amazon, gosh darn it, you're going to have as analog a life as possible. It is impossible to go through life, go through a day, without in some way being touched by or having to interact with the products produced by Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft. It's the cloud software that's powering nearly everything. We have, you know, it's the platforms we're using to write and to teach. It's the ways we're communicating. It's, it's everywhere. So helping both people inside the technology and people outside of the technology industry understand how we got to now and how this history is relevant to where law goes next, where industry goes next, and where the two interact was what I sought to do with this book. So who made Silicon Valley is the question that this book helps to answer. Now, when we think of who made Silicon Valley, you might think, oh, you might think that I went to, um, you might think it's this person, 
or if you're really feeling historical, you might say these guys. Um, but who made Silicon Valley is a much bigger tapestry. It's a much bigger cast of characters, and it goes back longer. How did Silicon Valley go from a place that in the first several decades, up till the middle part of the 20th century, was best known as the nation's center of prune production, as yet another agricultural valley in California, very sleepy, not particularly distinguished by any distinguishing characteristics other than one, which I'll get to in a minute. And how did it transform? The answer to that is not just a story of technology and technological brilliance and entrepreneurship, which is often the way the story usually goes. Kind of, it's this special place out in Northern California where every these you know these iconoclastic entrepreneurs are thinking different and bucking tradition and doing all these things. Yes, but it is also it's the story of Greatest Generation and Korea Generation men with engineering degrees who were as square as the you know, Steve Jobs generation and after were not, <laughs> who came out to work in the electronics industry in the 50s and the 60s, often not, didn't come out to start companies. No, they were just coming to work in the West Coast branches of very large East Coast-based electronics companies that were doing defense work. They're men who first worked in industry, and then became venture capitalists, like this man, David Morgenthaler, who became a venture capitalist, who was an early investor in Apple. This connective tissue between someone who was a 24-year-old, uh, you know, World War II GI, and then a kind of post-war post uh, greatest genera generation crew cut square in a suit and tie, who then becomes a seed investor in Apple, and then later other companies, including the company that becomes commercialized and spins off and is bought by Apple that uh, produces Siri, the voice recognition system in your iPhones. This very, these very modern technologies, someone who in his 90s was funding uh, uh, engineering competitions at MIT, his alma mater. That the cool thing about the history of Silicon Valley is you have people like David Morgenthaler whose lifespan spans the history of the valley and helps us understand this longer, uh, this longer accumulation of expertise and, um, and, and business change. Because one of the secret ingredients of Silicon Valley, and this is something that is hard for would-be Silicon Valleys elsewhere to really internalize, it's time. It's the accumulation of successive generations of entrepreneurs and mentors and funders and money that builds on itself. The story of Silicon Valley, who built Silicon Valley, is also people like Anne Hardy, who Sean mentioned in his introduction. Women who were boxed out of formal entries into programming or business management. Um, Anne Hardy, not only as an undergraduate, was not allowed to major in the scientific and engineering major she wanted to major in, but as a, once she, she, she as a young professional, she wanted to raise up, rise up the management chain. And the way that one did that was to go to get your MBA. And, and all the best people were getting there were Harvard MBAs. But at the time, Harvard Business School didn't admit women. So all these places in which these other, where men were allowed to get on the escalator, women were not allowed to. And combine that with the fact that there was this prevailing idea that Programming at first was, was something that didn't require any brains, so it was OK to have women doing it. But once there was a recognition that it actually required something, some, some creativity, some talent, that this is, this is perhaps programming the software is the most important thing to, you can do, then women are seen as, well, they're not tech, there's no such thing as a technical woman. Women aren't inter interested in this, and they're not very good at it. And Hardy learns to program by working at IBM in the 1950s. By the 1960s, she's in, in California, she uh, presents herself to an, a startup that's in the business of time sharing, which was the, the, this was the internet before the internet, connecting computers, getting mainframe computers to, to have these remote terminals that you could access computer power from far away. And she shows up and they have a computer that they, a mini computer they bought, this company has bought to use as the hub of their time sharing network. And they realize it doesn't have a functioning operating system. They kind of missed that part that you needed to actually have an operating system to make it work. Because these guys were hardware guys that started it. So she shows up and says, well, I'll build you an, an OS. I'll build the operating system. And they said, OK, fine. 
And she did it, and it was great, and it was integral. And later on, the CEO of the company said, you know, Anne, I, if I had known how critical this operating system was to our business, I never would have hired a woman to do it. Um, and that is a story that we hear again and again. The, the story of Silicon Valley and who built Silicon Valley is also a story about demographic transformation. Again and again, we see these intersections between political history, social history, and technological history. To think about the valley and think about the technology industry as something that is apart from the other things going on is, doesn't give you the full picture. It's the story of westward migration to California, of, of California's huge population boom, and then the baby boom on top of that. I don't know what these boys and girls grew up to be, these first graders from Palo Alto in 1955, but I can bet you that there are a few people that went into the technology industry in the 60s and 70s. And they had a very different worldview from the David Morgan Thalers and the Ann Hardys. They were children of the Vietnam generation. Tech, law, and politics are always connected in the story. In the story. They never go away. There are all these moments if we sort of if we decide that we're going to look at tech history through a the lens of a political historian or a legal scholar, you see all these moments of intersection and generation. And I think this is very important to to think about think in this way now at a moment where they're in this town. A lot of people thinking about what the next regulatory regime around tech and, and the internet economy is going to be. Some people have some wrongheaded ideas about it. Some people don't want any of it. Some people want a lot of it. There's there's going to be, certainly there's going to be something that happens. We don't know what. There are all these moments that I wanted to pull out in the book where you see the sort of simultaneous intersection. The first time that a computer appears on network television, it's predicting the 19, outcome of the 1952 election, the role of computers and digital power in politics and the disruptive role of computing and computer hardware and software in pol politics is something that precedes 2016. Uh, and, and not that this, dis this disrupted the outcome of the election. It's kind of a funny story. There's Walter Cronkite there, newly appointed anchor. Um, he's talking to Presper Eckert, who was the uh, developer of the ENIAC, who's uh, the, the, the digital star of Kathy's movie. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this is election eve 1952 was kind of a gimmick. They put a UNIVAC computer, which was the commercialized version of the, of the ENIAC, the first all digital computer on television to predict the outcome of the election before the polls of Clinton, before the results were in. It predicted Eisenhower in a landslide so decisively that the programmers were made very nervous by it and were kind of furiously you know, fitzing with the dials to make sure that it hadn't erroneously predicted something. Turns out it was absolutely on point. Um, it figured out the, the outcome of the election before, before the, the other means had found it. So, that you know, think starting from that starting point, thinking about where are these moments where you see a generative effect, this, this corresponding effect. You know, it's interesting to me that one of the things that reviewers and and a lot of the press on my book has picked up on something that I thought was kind of obvious to me, but apparently wasn't, which was that the military-industrial complex had this in incredibly important catalytic effect on the building of the tech industry, um, and people were like you know that you know. Her book shows that the Pentagon helped build the Silicon Valley. And everyone's like, wow. I'm like, wow, didn't everyone know that? No, they did not. Um, and so why Silicon Valley came to be? Silicon Valley came to be in part because California and the West were where this gusher of Cold War spending went, starting in World War II, going into the Cold War, where military spending is, and particularly in the case of the Valley, spending on electronic weaponry, electronics, is something that particularly benefits the Valley, which by the early 50s has become a place that is a hub of small electronics production and, and communications devices, radar, microwave. Um, is it any surprise that it goes on to be the place where the personal computer takes industry takes root and then the internet? What, it, it's, there's, a, there's connective technological tissue that comes from the 1950s and the forward. But it's not just the Cold War generally. It's also, in particular, the space race. So what do you need when you're at, once the president declares that you're going to get to the moon by the end of the 1960s? You need the fastest, most powerful, and lightest electronics possible to power rockets, to power to send a man to the moon. And so here's another example of how the, the governmental story, the policy story, and, and, the, and the tech story intersects in ways that kind of push against the 
the, the cowboy mythology of, of Silicon Valley. But also leaves room for entrepreneurial creation and ingenuity, too. I think these two things coexist. Fairchild Semiconductor. If you, this is, this is a firm that a lot of people in technology know about because it is held up again and again as the great granddaddy of all venture-backed startups. And it was. It was the first venture-backed startup. Started by eight guys who came out to California to work for a guy named William Shockley, who was a co-inventor of the transistor, to build a silicon semiconductors. Within a year, they'd realized that among his other faults, William Shockley was a terrible boss. They all quit at once, started their own rival company called Fairchild Semiconductor. Fairchild Semiconductor in its, it had the great good fortune of incorporating two weeks before the Sputnik, the launch of the Sputnik satellite into orbit. And those in the room are probably well aware that the October 1957 launch of Sputnik set Washington's collective hair on fire and upped vastly increased spending on the space race generally and on missile production, anything that would shoot things up in the air was, you know, this was also coterminous with the missile gap, the sort of worries that the Soviets were not only far ahead in sending things into space, but also in building missiles. And the thing that, of course, made Sputnik so fearsome is if you can send a satellite into space, you can send an intercontinental ballistic missile into space. I mean, that was the, you know, none of this, NASA was a civilian agency, but it was very much part of the Cold War. So Fairchild incorporates, and it is making these small, light devices, including the integrated circuit, which is this is one of the places that the integrated circuit has developed. Integrated circuit is a sort of po more powerful transistorized technology than that ever existed before. It's kind of the, the first microchip. There is no commercial market for these devices in the early 1960s. They're really expensive. They're really fancy. They're really blue sky. No, no other business needs them. But you know who needs them? The Apollo program needs them. And when NASA buys Fairchild semi uh, integrated circuits en masse, it drives down the cost. They're allowed to scale up production. And then there's space for a commercial market to develop. By the 1970s, the silicon semiconductor industry is what gives Silicon Valley its name. That Santa Clara Valley, this fruit growing region, becomes known in the industry as Silicon Valley. And then by the 1980s, when you have the development of consumer facing industries like personal computing and video games, it becomes known, more widely known as Silicon Valley and more familiar. This is, these are the founders of Intel, or the leaders of Intel, who are two of whom came from Fairchild Semiconductor, Bob Noyce in the middle and, Andy, and, and uh, Gordon Moore um, on, on the right, um, or the left, I'm getting, anyway, in the corner. Uh, Moore is the man who gives, his, gives the name to Moore's Law, which is the, the idea that computing power gets faster and cheaper um, by orders of magnitude over time. This other person is also important to the story of where policy and tech intersect. Andy Grove, who in addition to becoming the legendary president and CEO of Intel, uh, is, uh, arrives in the US in the 1940s as a teenage refugee from Hungary. Someone as he was entered, went through the immigration system, probably was not identified as someone who was going to be a critical figure in American business and a critical figure in tech. Um, not readily, uh, not obvious at first that this was going to be someone who, whose economic ROI was going to be high. So immigration and the, and the and immigrants and refugees play a disproportionately large role in the story of American tech. One of the secrets of Silicon Valley and American technology generally, it's not that Americans are better at tech. It's that the United States opened its doors to people from elsewhere who were really good at it and let them come and start companies here. And that has been a very important policy ingredient. So the first if the first generation is the Cold War generation, these generation of companies that, again, aren't defense contractors per se, um, are, but are companies that are kind of pushed off the, lunch, the launch pad by all of this defense spending and all of this uh, uh, space race spending. The next generation of companies come from a generation that are pushing against all of that, pushing against the fact that the federal government has such a monopoly on computer power, the fact that so much of computing is being focused on the business of war, that are coming out of college, Berkeley, Stanford, and thinking, I want to work anywhere but a defense contractor. 
I want to have any to do anything but work in something that has to do with the military. And these are people who are, but ironically, they're a generation that's exposed to computing and gets hooked on computing thanks to the military industrial complex, which among other things plunges lots of money into uh, computing and computer labs in research universities. So in the late 1960s, the baby boom generation on campus encounters computing for the first time. The really lucky ones of them encounter it in high school. This is um, Paul Allen and Bill Gates, the founders of Microsoft as high schoolers in Lakeside School in Seattle uh, that had its own computer lab, a teletype machine connected to computers at the University of Washington. This other photograph is of um, women in a Radcliffe dorm around the same time. So this sort of exposure to computing is coming thanks to the establishment that this generation wants to push against. And so as they come out of college and into the working world, they are hooked on computers and determined to find a way to make those computers personal. One of these idealists that I talk about in the book is this guy, Lee Felsenstein. Lee Felsenstein was part of the protest move, anti-war movement at Berkeley. He was not someone who was really into he was, he was, he's a shy person, was not into, it's working again, um, not, not an, an activist himself, not a big yeller, but he realized that the people who were yelling weren't properly amplified. So his contribution to the whole thing was to build a special megaphone for them to use at the protest. But Felsenstein is like, is one of a number of, of people, men and women, who are coming into, out of college and into the world in the, this is, I mean, may just move to the other microphone, or I'll just hold it closer. Um, that are moving to closer, in, coming out into the world in the late 60s and early 70s, determined to find a way to take computing power and get it out of the hands of the warmongers and put it in the hands of the people. And who take the ideas of the 1960s, the ideas that, that uh, the, the quest for social equity, for gender equity, racial justice, and are convinced that democratization of computing power is the way to do it. This is also a moment, the other thing that's going on politically here is another political story that I talk a little bit about in the book and I talk more in some other things that I've, I've written and things I'm continuing to work on, which is this longer history of computer privacy. And, some, and, and right now there's a lot of conversation about privacy and how much the computers know. This is not new. There have been worries about what computers know and, and how much they know about individuals and their intrusions on people's constitutional right to privacy since the beginning of the digital computer age. But significantly, in the 1960s and early 70s, when this was a very live conversation in Washington, D.C., the focus of the privacy crusaders' ire was not private companies. It was the government. Again, just like protesters like Lee Felsenstein said, why should all the mainframes be in the control, so many be under the control of the Pentagon? Why should the warmongers, people who got us into Vietnam, be harnessing this power to use for, for ill? At the same time, there's a push against government, a concern about how much government computers themselves know about individual privacy. And some of those pushing against privacy are those who are also pushing against the what they see as the excesses and intrusions of the great society, people like Sam Irvin of Watergate Committee fame, who at the same time he is becoming known as Chairman Sam, becoming a celebrity because of his, uh, his work on, on the Watergate investigation, is also pursuing privacy legislation that will limit how much the federal government can, uh, will in increase individuals' right to know what the federal government knows about them. The result of that is the Privacy Act of 1974, which if you go and read the text of the, the law itself, starts out the first few paragraphs just talking about computers. Significantly, two things it does not do. It does not say, it does not waste any ink on what private companies are doing. And they were gathering plenty of information. You know, direct mail was alive and well. Marketing, you know, the, the dark arts of marketing and targeted marketing were, were going along quite well. P political campaigns were using this sort of data to, to target voters. This was, this was going on, but the focus was all on government agencies. And the other thing that the Privacy Act did not do, and other, other pieces of legislation that, that were brought forth but did not, were not passed into, signed into law, did not do, 
was really address the question of, well, should the government be gathering or should anyone be gathering this information in the first place? It was the individual's right to know post hoc rather than should they be asking in the first place. Now, of course, the government needs to know a lot of demographic data about individuals in order for you know, programs to run. Uh, this is, you know, the, the, this is a, the, but this conundrum is sort of, the, here's this moment when we're thinking about, you know, why doesn't the U.S. have a privacy law? What might a privacy law look like? It's a really interesting moment to look back at this earlier debate and see where this wasn't, the path not taken. And interestingly enough, you would never think, you know, on an, 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 all other metrics, Sam Irvin and the Berkeley anti-war movement would have very little in common, but they totally agreed on this. And so there's this, this, this push against the government having so much control over technology that's coming in from all sides during this Vietnam Watergate moment. Again, reading tech history into political history and legal history and having them all, you know, showing the connections helps us better understand how we got to now. So out of this political moment, becomes a new movement that becomes an industry. Idealists like Lee Felsenstein were in the were there, you know, crafting their motherboards, homebrewing their own computers, talking about how you create a desktop machine built around these powerful microprocessors that not only can allow, allow people to create something on their desktop, but also to connect computer to computer. And if we all connect via computer, then we're going to, all of the differences that divide us in the real world are all going to evaporate. It's going to be great. If we just connect the world, if we connect everybody on the same platform, see, this all has a history. This is all coming from a, a place. There, there are people, today's technologists, today's tech leaders, are taking their cues from, even if they don't know it, earlier, these earlier ideas. But the idealists like Lee Felsenstein did not become billionaires. The people who married that idealism with capitalism did. Steve Jobs, who's someone that when I went into this product project, I said, I am not going to write about Steve Jobs. Everyone writes about Steve Jobs. He's over, like done, done, done. And then as I got into it, I was like, I have to write about Steve Jobs because Steve Jobs is, there's a reason he's Steve Jobs. But putting Steve Jobs in context, whole other avenues open up about understanding how and why Apple became Apple. There were a lot of computer companies like Apple in the late 70s, a lot of them. And these two Steves were just as hippy-dippy as everyone else. But Steve Jobs had two things. One, he had ability to tell a really good story. And he was, from the very first moment, had very high ambition for Apple becoming a very significant company. And he knew the only way they were going to get out of that garage and be taken seriously is they ha if they had managerial expertise brought in-house from other companies that had been successful before. So Mike Markula, who was an Intel executive, who had recently retired in his mid-30s because he'd made so much money, comes back, invests some of his money, becomes in as sort of the operator who's making Apple work like a real company. Apple positioned itself, has always positioned itself as a very countercultural, think different. It is as traditional as it comes. It is not a, you know, these companies that become very successful have org charts that are remarkably like General Motors. They're not that different. But Jobs also hires the best in the business marketing person to help him craft a campaign that takes the complex this very esoteric product that no one really understands, and find a way to express it to people that says, this is going to be the tool you can use that's going to change your life. Rather than saying, we have this much RAM and ROM and blah, 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 like no technical specs, or they're buried deep inside. You talk about how the personal computer, which, by the way, the Steves did not invent, but whatever, we created a new kind of bicycle, a bicycle for the mind that enhances human ability. I mean, what a great analogy. You can think about, okay, I can walk this far at, at this speed, but if I have a bike, I can go faster. And I'm still propelling it. I'm still in charge. It's still me, but I now have this machine that enhances what I can do. 
Personal computing introduces Silicon Valley to the world. Video games simultaneously introduce Silicon Valley to the world and particularly to its kids. And so another, there's a real change in the early 1980s, not only you know, the kind of we think about the computer revolution. Well, it becomes the revolution hits, hits us because suddenly there are these products that you can buy in a store that are made in Silicon Valley. And the heads of the companies who make these products are different than the CEOs that you've seen and heard about before. So, and this, they're also coming onto the scene at a moment in American economic history. Like, let's think about the late 70s and early 80s, shall we? How are we feeling about, you know, manufacturing? What were the headlines? When you went to Business Week, Business Week magazine, what did you, what'd you read? You read Japan, layoffs. Everything's going, you know, Sunset Industries, Rust Belt, Rust, Rust, Rust. And then you would hit the little section that then was called Information Processing, which was computer hardware and software. And it was all unicorns and rainbows. They have swimming pools outside. You can go and, like, hang out in the middle of the day and go swimming. They have great uh, happy hours. Life is good. Life is different. So Silicon Valley's rise as an idea and as an industry is kind of embedded by the fact that faith in everything else is falling apart, faith in government, faith in business, and of course, it's rising high at a moment when someone enters the White House that is aggressively and, and enthusiastically promoting entrepreneurship, Ronald Reagan. There are all sorts of intersections that I love showing between politics and tech throughout the book. There are stories of people who themselves kind of embody these contradictions. They're extraordinary entrepreneurs. They are self-made men. And yet, there is this hidden story of law and policy that, under, that helps us understand their rise. Take, for example, these two people, who at the time of this, this photograph were in business together. Ross Perot encounters Steve Jobs in the late 1980s after Jobs has been fired from Apple has started his new workstation company next. First starts self-financing it, very quickly starts running out of money because he's spending all this money on nice design, as you might imagine. Perot comes in with an infusion of cash. Um, for a few months, they're happy, 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 unlikely bedfellows. Then the unlikeliness kind of gets in the way of them. It wasn't a very long-lived partnership. But I tell their story in the book. I tell this story in the book. But I think the two of them together, again, embody this tension in this contradiction. Steve Jobs in 1984, Steve, he was, so 1984, he's, he's talking to a reporter. He's like, yeah, I've never voted in my life. And he wasn't remotely embarrassed about it. Um, Gary Hart was running for president, comes and has lunch with Steve Jobs, try to court him, try to get his endorsement. And Jobs kind of blew him off. He's like, that's so uninteresting. To me. Like, why, why is this? Why does this matter? He had this very, this public face of just being, I'm above it all. Politics is messy and gross. And why would you have anything to do with it? We're building the future. Bye, bye, Washington. Hidden in that story is that two years earlier, he'd gone to Capitol Hill for two straight weeks to lobby for tax breaks for computers in schools, which would benefit Apple. And then he doesn't get that at a national level, but does get it from Jerry Brown in California. And that, that's also a big benefit for Apple. So California school children, the first computer they encounter through the 1980s is an Apple. There's a, there's, this is a very good, very good business move. But also, it's an understanding that government is really critical, that politics is not something to brush off, that this actually is part of the business. Ross Perot was an even bigger, he's, this is not, you know, he's not a Silicon Valley person, but he's a tech person before he was a third party candidate for president in 92 and 96. Mr. Perot was a legendary tech mogul. He was, he's a self-made man, an extraordinary entrepreneur. He worked for IBM for, uh, as a salesman. It's the first part of his career after he was in the military. Uh, in IBM, the, if, you win, if you make your quota in one year, you're called a 100 percenter. They have this 100 percent club for the best sales people. Ross Perot was a 300 percenter. The guy is, I mean, as you would imagine, just relentless. Ross Perot was a billionaire with a B in the late 1960s, thanks to tech, thanks to his company. But you know what made him a billionaire with a B? The Medicare and Medicaid program. Because that, his company went from small startup to ginormous enterprise. EDS got the contract to digitize, to do all the electronic data processing for California and Texas and a whole bunch of other states' Medicare and Medicaid programs after the program was passed in 1966. 
So here we have these, and you know, this is a guy who's a folksy businessman running out, you know, he runs for president, he's kind of running as this, I'm not a Washington, not a hack, I'm someone who's, who's a fresh, fresh voice. And both Jobs and Perot are both, yes, they are both entrepreneurs and they are, have these connections to politics and government that are often acknowledged. And we have a hard time holding those two notions in our, in our heads at the same time. One of the free market entrepreneurs, you know, free from government interference, and the other being the government made it all. Actually, it's both, that those things coexist. And that is the secret of Silicon Valley, is they're both co co-mingling, co-terminus. Politics, politicians, again, of both parties, I love this picture. I just have to throw it in there because I love this picture. Um, I call this the advanced man's nightmare. Uh, so this is Ronald Reagan in Moscow in May of 1988. Uh, his advance team did unsuccessfully try to get the Lenin statue, a sort of curtain put over it. No go. The, the Soviet hosts were like, nope, you're going to be right in front of him. But he's speaking to 650 computer science students at Moscow State University. I wonder what some of them are doing now. Uh, and he's talking about the American Revolution. He's not talking about founding fathers. He's not even talking about general issue, free market, capitalism, you know, conservatism. No, he's talking about microchips. He's talking about entrepreneurs and garages. He's talking about the Silicon Valley mythos and pumping it up and saying, this is what American democracy can bring you. And he's right, but he also was leaving out the, the government part. Bill Clinton and Al Gore, my old boss, were also very much kind of cling, grabbing on to the mythos of Silicon Valley and all the kind of the golden aura of these tech entrepreneurs as a way to move the Democratic Party to the center, to sort of declare we're a new sort of Democratic Party, that we aren't against capitalism, we just like these types of capitalists. They also were very much um, promoters of and allies with the 1990s internet industry, the nascent internet industry, and kind of believing that, again, if you connect everybody by computer, if you close the digital divide, if you connect, bring, bring the internet into schools, this is net day in 1996, which was this big, became a few years in a row, they went and kind of wired schools for the internet, this is out in California then that is going to be the answer to ed educational inequality. That's going to be the answer to all these really thorny real world problems. They also are working closely and allied closely with the young, silic mostly Silicon Valley based internet industry in kind of helping craft rules of the road for what the online world is going to become, including allowing the internet industry to largely self-regulate. So, which made sense at the time, when they were the little guys and Comcast and the cable providers were the big guys. When you didn't have Facebook, when, you, when Google didn't exist, when Amazon had been in business for two years, it made sense. This close alliance between Washington and particularly Democrats in Washington and the Valley has continued until not so long ago. It seems like a long time ago. But only four years ago, I was at Stanford on sabbatical, and I remember when Barack Obama came and gave a speech at a cybersecurity summit at Stanford. And he, the speech, you know, Mark Zuckerberg could have given that speech. It was a great idealistic, techno-optimistic, we're all working together, we're building a better world, we're connecting everyone. Tech is going to be this incredibly productive and generative force in society. And let's keep at it. And we've discovered in the years since that that was not really the whole story. And Silicon Valley itself, the stories it tells about itself, the stories it believes about itself, have left out so much of the broader context, the broader tapestry. No, Silicon Valley, you didn't, it didn't invent the internet. It wasn't even internet invented there. It came from DARPA. <laughs> yes, there was a node of the first, first, one of the first nodes of the internet in the valley, but there was also one at the University of Utah it's not, just, it's not just these entrepreneurial co companies. It's their entrepreneurship being made possible by law and by policy. That these things work together, not necessarily, are not always antagonistic and not always separate. And understanding that integration is how we figure out what the right solutions are going forward. I'm not here to prescribe the solutions. 
I think history gives us some good ideas, some basic things that would, are good. But there is recognizing this interrelationship and that Silicon Valley is not some special, unique place. It's, it's, it's part of American history. It's a product of American history. It's a product of law and policy and politics and political decisions. Po po decisions to do things, to regulate and to deregulate, right? To raise taxes, to cut taxes. I mean, there's, there are things government does that are, you know, work both ways. It's not just more government. It's also government deciding to pull back. And that has enabled a lot of things, but it also has enabled a lot of the things that have been destructive about tech, as well as a lot of things that have been constructive. So I am so glad that I had this opportunity to talk to you all about it, and I'm really excited to have a conversation about it now that I'm done. So thank you very much. Yes. Do you want to self-moderate, or do you want me to just call on people? You can call okay. them. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, questions, thoughts? Stun them into silence. Yeah, in the back. In the back. Sorry. Yes. Oh, no, it was Al Gore. Yeah. <laughs> the young Al Gore. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it helps. It helps if govern if in terms of economic tech as a means for economic development or tech focused economic development. I think it helps governments better understand and calibrate what is really important and what is just you're spending lots of money on a nice research park and it's not going to really generate what you think it is. Um, one of the things that you know, I think one of the things that is frustrating about this story from a sort of pure economic development, what's my strategy perspective, is that there's a lot of happy accidents that go into it. Um, and including the DC technology corridor, which is, again, a product of the, all of this federal activity around, including around tech, and, and, and these infrastructure companies that are um, building on and closely related to sort of what's enabled by what's happening in telecom law, what's happening in terms of the physical infrastructure, the plumbing of the internet. Um, and in and, and D.C. now, too, just the sheer concentration of educated people who are here for a variety of reasons. But it's a very easy place. You know, there's a reason Amazon chose Arlington. It's you can get people to move here. Like, it's the people you want. You're 25,000 people. You can, you know, this, the, the recruitment and retention is why HQ2 was a gambit. Um, it was also a gambit to see how much we can get local governments to give us. <laughs> it was really smart. Um, so I, I think that, but where you, if you think about um, from, you know, what does gender, what are the ingredients? I think universities are an ingredient, but you have to recognize that not all universities are like Stanford. Stanford is, um, has this outsized role in the Valley and, and this generative role in part because it is not only a research university, but is a private research university that completely remade its curriculum in the 1950s to pump up physics and engineering and kind of, did away with things like public policy school and all that silly stuff. Um, and, and created kind of from a, from a liberal arts education perspective, a very unbalanced institution. I mean, it's Stanford now has so much money that every place is just, you know, you open a closet and money pours out, um, which I remind my friends in the history department there when they complain about their jobs. I was like, hey, come, come up to my public university, why don't you? Um, uh, but there's a... Uh, you know, we forget that, but there is a, a really critical role higher education plays, and it's not in tech transfer necessarily, although that is important. It's really in people. It's the people. And so, again, that's a Washington advan DC advantage. Pe kids come to AU, they graduate, they stick around. Um, having lots of educational institutions, having a, a um, uh, having, yes, a, a kind of, a, a, some sort of cluster of 
industry in place that has a technological need or already has a technological orientation. And now that's become more expansive. So I think the rise of the rest, kind of the Steve Case case for other, is actually much more feasible now than it was even 15 years ago. First of all, every company is a technology company. You can be a you know trucking company and you need software, right? Everything is everything. Well, is, especially if you're going to be a driverless trucking company, but that's another thing. Um, and and also the the kind of there is a saturation point that the valley has almost reached in terms of affordability. And I mean, there are a lot of people who are opting out and opting out of Seattle too. And so these smaller to mid-sized metros are have a more of an advantage. They do have to have that pull factor though. The pull factor of the kind of, oh yeah, I want to live in this place because it's cool, because I can get coffee, because there's a good restaurant, because there's good, and also there are good schools for my kids, and there's, good, there's this social infrastructure. And the social infrastructure piece was super important in the growth of the Valley. You know, high, having really high quality public education in California up until the late 70s when they start, stopped funding it um, was super important in understanding why all these kids kind of were were there and why they were able to do what they did. Same thing with really cheap public higher education. You know, go to Berkeley for $50 a semester. That's a huge, huge escalator to mo upward mobility. And so these are not easy things to solve. It's much easier to build a research park. But these are the things that actually generate real results. And that's a, that's a that's a harder, it's it's a harder sell to make to politicians who are like, I want to show results in the next term before I'm reelected. Yeah. Um, well, there's, you know, it's interesting. So as, as Sean mentioned, that the non-compete, um, non-enforcement of non-compete agreements um, is, is a really important factor in allowing this job hopping of people and this dissemination of ideas. But there's still this very, um, you know, ongoing sort of trade secrets question that goes back and forth with these companies are battling with one another. What is really interesting to me is that um, just, what, a week or two ago, there was the first instance I have know of of a criminal prosecution or criminal um, indictments coming down on this guy, Anthony Lewandowski, who was a, a Google engineer who then went to Uber and with, took with him in a kind of bl brazen act of, of IP theft, like copied 16,000 files off his computer that had to do with his proprietary driverless car technology that he and his team had developed at Google. And he moves it over to Uber. Uh, and he's actually like been indicted for, for that. Because <laughs> I think it was just so, so brazen. But, bef but until that, it's, it, you know, there have been um, cases brought down for, you know, the, in the 80s, there were all these gray market um, chip, gray market, black market, chip resellers, microchip resellers that had, they were kind of big criminal operations, quite frankly. And the only time that criminal charges were ever brought were when there was espionage involved. When it was like, oh, you're selling our chips to China. Um, and so there, there's this interesting, there's kind of been this toleration of kind of a, a Wild West toleration of a lot of um, in part because it's fast moving because the law has oftentimes not kept up with the technology itself. Um, but also I think because there's been such free movement of people that, and so often the ideas are so closely attached to their authors rather than the company that created them. Um, there's very short tenures in Silicon Valley companies. They notoriously job hop. It's one reason that, um, it's one reason Microsoft is in Seattle because they'd wanted to like keep people there uh, and, and not have people leave. Uh, it's one reason that a lot of tech companies have moved to Seattle because they, people stick around longer <laughs> and, don't, and, uh, and you don't have, um, and you have enforcement of, um, of non-compete agreements. So there, there's this sort of, there's been sort of this interesting loosey-goosey. There are a lot of things that have been allowed to go on in a kind of loosey-goosey fashion for a long time that now suddenly are being taken more seriously now that tech is bigger. And now the companies are so big. 
So the dominance by a few very, very large companies, there have always been big companies in the space, but now we're kind of back to a kind of IBM style, you know, regime of, you know, back in the mainframe era where you just had, a, where you have these very large companies with immense resources that have uh, a lot of control over markets. <laughs> I'm not going to say monopoly control, but that they're, but that is kind of changing the way in which they're, some of their practices that have been pretty, you know, look, Silicon Valley wasn't a big fan of HR departments for a long time, which is why you have this sort of crappy gender culture. Um, that, you know, there or or that you know, HR was like uncool, and you know, we're going to ignore them. It, it, and and so those things are all sort of very quickly coming to a head. And there's there needs there's a new reckoning, and I'm really curious to kind of see what the next five years bring. absence of what we are now more and more conventionally led to denounce as corruption. Mm. That is the influence of money on policy. Mm. Um, no, I think there are two, I think it's two different things. I think now there's an interesting, I think now, now we have very extraordinarily well-financed lobbying and operations coming out of these individual companies that is a new new thing, kind of a post, let's call it. Immigration policy. Yes, exactly. yeah. There has been, for decades, heavy, concerted industry lobbying involving lots of money yeah. around immigration policy yes. to secure the H -1D. flow of talented foreign-born mm -hmm. engineers and developers into the United States. Is that... Is that corruption, or is that somehow a, a healthy interaction between between government and? Oh governments? well, I wouldn't say it's it's healthy, but it's business lobbying. It's a, you know it's it's this in this broader landscape of the escalation of business lobbying since the beginning of the nineteen seventies, where you have a, a, a kind of a system that is awash in corporate money, and and the Valley take on immigration is really interesting. In that it's you know yes very vocal on immigration but really kind of just most interested in the the immigration of the type of people they need like the H one B, um, and 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 very successful at it and very and, and kind of coloring I think coloring the debate that's sort of like well we're okay with immigrants if they're best and brightest type of immigrants which which is that when I pipe up and say hey Andy Grove was not best and brightest I mean he was a smart kid uh, but. You know, the, the, and also the tr so many children of immigrants and refugees are important technologists. And, and even if you don't have the headliners, you have the, the all of the, you know, the people who aren't famous but are very critical to the whole story. I, I don't know if corruption would be, I think what, what we have now is we have an extremely wealthy industry that is flexing its political muscle. But interestingly enough, it had a different... It's always been flexing its muscle in some way in Washington. You go back to the 70s and the early 80s. In the 70s, you have the venture capitalists and the Electronics Association coming and lobbying for lowered capital gains taxes. But they still were kind of this boutique group of guys. Uh, they were not the main, main action, right? They, were, they had struggled to get the Reagan administration, which was as business-friendly as they come, to kind of make Reaganomics work for them too because it was designed for kind of all purpose, you know, big corporate America, which, and they weren't big then. A and now the biggest of the big companies are big and they've got lots of money to, and they now have political expertise in house. They have people who've worked in Washington who are now working in these companies. There's been a lot of back and forth from the Clinton administration onward, particularly of Democrats, but also Republicans who've left government service and gone into, Sean and I know a number of people who've ended up in the tech industry. Did we kill the golden goose? I don't think you. I, I think there's a bigger there's a bigger question about you know money in politics that goes well beyond tech. I think there's another question about killing the golden goose that is raised by antitrust 
questions, by broader regulatory questions. Um, and, and then there's also a lot of you know, antitrust questions that sort of break them up solutions that are not going to actually solve for the problems they're trying to solve for, too. So this is really sticky. And, and you know, one of the things, I, I think what's actually very useful now is to look at the longer history of antitrust and see, and not just look at the breakups, but look at what's happened with far more frequency, as those people in the room know, in this room know, it, it, which is enforcement and consent decrees and things like the 1956 AT&T consent decree that forced them to license the transistor technology for free and then subsequent technologies for cheap. Gordon Moore later says we would have not had a semiconductor industry in the Valley had that not been for that consent decree. So here's a great example of antitrust enforcement that spurred innovation. AT&T kept on making plenty of money. It did fine. It didn't wither up and die after that. It, you know, it, it endured as, a, as, as Ma Bell until the 80s. And it really, when it broke up, it was, you know, partially crying uncle because it really wanted to get in the computer business, finally. <laughs> and so there's, a, there's these sort of interesting contours that I think are left out of, that certainly legal scholars are well aware of, but they're left out of the political co conversation, which, as it usually is, is a lot of blunt instruments and, and hard, hard talk. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, I talk about the EFF. I talk about the the, uh, the Electronic Freedom Foundation. These other very consequential groups and technologists that are are kind of entering the political conversation in the early '90s, and it comes in. And really, again, it's it's a human story. It's a story of you know. I think it's not. It's it's an important that really there are three people on Capitol Hill in the '80s who are meaningfully paying attention to the computer hardware and software industries and the nascent sort of the, the potential of the internet. Um, and those three people are Ed Markey, who was chair of this telecom subcommittee at the time, um, who was sort of thinking about meaningfully about all, a lot of these things, as was his staff. Um, Al Gore, who was bringing computer scientists into his Senate office to kind of talk tech and, you know, was very early adopter. And Newt Gingrich, who was a huge fan of Alvin Toffler, by the way. Um, and uh, who really were, you know, and Newt New Gingrich kind of had the galaxy brain version of, you know, the, the potential of the internet. Al Gore was, yeah, it was pretty galaxy brain too, but was really, they were all kind of thinking a few, like five years ahead about what these things might do, and they were talking to technologists a lot. And at the beginning, and then there were a few technologists that were making efforts to really communicate with Washington. And the, the way that they, the story they told was very consequential in the way that, that the ideas about what should be done about regulating the internet would, were formed. One of those people was Mitch Kapor, who I talk about in the book, founder of Lotus, also a co-founder of the EFF, along with John Perry Barlow. John Perry Barlow um, was a, a total anti-government, you know, he's like, I have no, no patience for these people. He's the guy who authored of independence of cyberspace, who just thought that, you know, Al Gore has the information superhighway, that's just so old economy, you know, and, and we're cyberspace, the rules are completely different and, and all, everything is going to be completely different now. Um, Mitch, on the other hand, was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to sit down with Ed Markey and Al Gore and I'm going to talk to them about, we need to commercial, we need to open up the internet to commercial activity. The internet at the time, they were allowing dot-com domains, but you couldn't buy or sell anything on that because that would, you know, corrupt the purity of it. It opened, so in the early 90s, that's opened up to commercial activity. Then is um, uh, 
there's a, but of course you can buy, you, you could buy and sell on the internet, but there was no way to make it secure. Um, there was a, another policy I talk about in the book that's sort of this strange kind of random thing that no one, uh, that no one talks about is this Commerce Department defense readjustment grant that was going to, California got a whole bunch of defense Commerce Department grants after the end of the Cold War for sort of readjusting to the civilian economy. And a group of folks in Silicon Valley got a hold of one of those and used it to build, to figure out how to build the apparatus for e-commerce or safe e-commerce on the internet. So VeriSign comes out of that, a lot of the technologies that allow us to, you know, use a credit card on the internet, allegedly not have hackers steal it, um, comes out of that. So this close, these sort of, but what the case that the Valley broadly defined as make it, is, is making, and the young internet industry, which was very young, so think about what the, the net was like in 94, 95, 96, even at the beginning of the book. Like, go back on the Wayback Machine and look at Yahoo's first homepage and take yourself back to kind of how radically different it all was. There was, Amazon would just come online. They're selling books on the internet. Everyone thinks it's completely goofy. People are like mailing Jeff Bezos checks in the mail because they don't trust doing any sort of monetary transaction on the internet. The, the best-selling book is this really thick computer manual, like that only the true believers are buying anything on the internet. And so at the time that the Communications Decency Act, the Telecom Act, is being debated, and, and at, even at the time of its passage, you have a young internet industry that is making the case quite forcefully and mobilizing around this idea that we should, not, we should be the regulators of our speech. And they were, the Dave, they were the Davids, and the Goliaths were the telecom companies. And they were very, very different. They were the, the media companies were over there, and the internet companies were over here. And so what's happened subsequently, we're, uh, we've got this rules of the road that really were, they really did make sense for what the world was like in the mid-90s. They really did. They weren't, this wasn't some kind of crazy deregulation. I mean, it was of the temp the temperament of the 90s, you know, the Republicans had taken over both houses of Congress, there was sort of a conservative term, there was other deregulation going on, but it made, it, it made sense for what the industry was then. And subsequently, these same companies have become media companies. They've become the, the platforms on which so many commerce and speech and political speech is conducted. And we have completely incompatible rules. Now, is the answer to say, regulate the whole damn thing? No, but it's to find ways for Section 230 to actually work in 2019 and 2020. And um, this, but there's a real, I, I love how it really boils down to just a few people having conversations, as office politics often does. And that, that sort of disseminates outward. And it was a relatively small group of folks who were really actively working on these issues in the 90s, and they've had such a, a consequential effect. Why don't we uh, use that as a point to close the formal conversation and take, take ourselves outside? Thank you very much. We covered Section 230 in, in cyber law. A couple of our <laughs> students just got to hear that story twice. Right. Uh, let's please give Margaret a hand. <laughs>